Amen. Thank you for that wonderful song. Never heard that before. And I appreciate all the music that we've had this morning, and it's went right along with the message. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I blame the youth department. I blame Brother Richard and his wife and all the teenagers because every time, it seems, every year that they come up here and put the snow-capped mountains and the snow all over the stage, and they put the blizzard banner up here, we have Arctic Blast and Snowmageddon and all these crazy things that have happened in the last few years. And so I blame the youth department for the cold, but I'm glad that you're here this morning. And I am glad that we have a warm place to meet and we have freedom to meet in the Lord's this morning and to share God's word. Uh, but I do, I, I blame the youth department for all of this. Uh, and I, I will probably every year that this happens. But uh, we had a great youth uh, rally yesterday. Thank you for those. Uh, we had a fantastic group of people that were out uh, probably Probably the most volunteers I think that we've ever had for one of the youth rallies, uh, and I just appreciate all of you that came out and gave of your Saturday to be a help and to minister to those young people that came from all over the Metroplex. I uh, had a good crowd and a great preaching service. Uh, some decisions were made, and uh, the kids had a great time in the afternoon playing, even though it was cold. Uh, but it kind of the Lord kept it a little warm until they were leaving, and then it just got colder and colder, as you know, yesterday. And so uh, we had a wonderful youth rally, and I appreciate all the people that helped uh, and were involved in that. And of course you know that I'm just kidding about blaming the youth department uh, for the cold. Uh, they can't possibly control that, but we were having a good rally yesterday. I appreciate that. As we move on in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and in our series uh, in the life of Christ, we move to the next scene uh, in the Lord's life. It would be still, if we were going in every, every moment and every aspect, of course, uh, the evangelist John told us that you can't ever cover all of what Jesus did and said because the books of the whole world would not contain what Jesus did for us in those short three and a half years. But as we move along, we're going to have to skip over a couple events, a couple teaching opportunities that the Lord took uh, about the end times and some other things. We've went through that quite sufficiently uh, in the last couple Sundays. And so we're going to move on uh, to another uh, place in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited. I've been so excited all week. Uh, and I was just praying that the Lord would not allow us to have to shut down today uh, and not have service because of the weather, because I'm very excited and trying to try to sort of contain myself today uh, as best I can, but this message is so awesome. Uh, it's such a beautiful picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I want you to join me in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, and we're going to move into those last couple or actually the last night before the cross. Uh, we're moving into the crucifixion, the trial, uh, the sufferings of the Lord, and we're moving uh, swiftly through these things. And God willing, if the Lord allows and uh, purposes all of it the way that I've prayed and in a way that I think he will, uh, we should be at resurrection morning on Easter. And that's the plan. Uh, and so uh, just pray that the Lord will orchestrate all those things as only he can uh, with the dates and the calendar of uh, the way it's working this year. Luke 22, and I want you to begin reading with me in verse 7. Luke 22, 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire uh, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now there is so much here that we could have brought a lunch 
and we could have service all day, and we still wouldn't cover everything that's here. But don't get nervous. We're not going to do that, and I'm not going to keep you past the time, but I'm just telling you there's so much here this morning that we could go over, uh, and I'm going to try with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Lord, the Lord uh, to this morning to only give you what the Lord needs you to have so that we can be precise this morning. Now, as we see, the Lord is preparing his disciples and asking for a place to be prepared so that they can eat and celebrate the Passover. The Passover is an Old Testament ceremony. And for thousands of years, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, has celebrated in good times, in bad times. They've gotten away from the Lord and stopped celebrating for long periods of time. But all throughout their history, since the days of Moses, they have celebrated the Passover celebration. And so Jesus, if you go back and do some study, the Passover was led by the father of the home. Uh, it was led by a, a, a man, and he did all the prayers and all the passing out of the food and all the different things in the ceremony. Uh, a man was to do those things for his own household. And Jesus, if you look back in his ministry, has never led the Passover, never led it with his disciples until this night. And he is going to send Peter and John out to find the place of the Passover where they're going to celebrate. And it's interesting that he only asked the, 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 the owner of the home and when Peter and John get there. And, of course, it's a, it's a huge sign that he tells them, well, find a man that's carrying a water pot on his, on his shoulders uh, and follow him into the house where he goes. There wasn't men that carried water pots around back then, you understand? In that culture, that was the woman's job. And, and, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what happened back then. Uh, and so uh, the women carried the pots around, and they carried the water and the different food back and forth from uh, the different places that you purchased it at. And so if you saw a man carrying a water pot, that was a pretty, uh, pretty specific sign. And so Peter and John are following this man with the water pot. They go into the house, and Jesus just asked for a room, a guest room, the guest chambers, the smallest room that they had. And notice, even as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he is not presumptuous. He's not uh, overbearing. Jesus just said, hey, give us our little room over here. And the, the man obviously was a follower or someone interested in serving the Lord. And so he said, no, 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 no. There's no guest chambers. There's no small room going to be set aside for you. Lord, you need the, the upper room. You need the best room. You need the big salon, the big room. You need the, the upper chambers. And so that's where we're going to prepare. And so this man prepared the entire table, uh, the low table on almost on the ground. He prepared all the pillows for them to recline on. He prepared the bitter herbs. He, he prepared everything but the sacrifice of the lamb that would be uh, eaten that night. He prepared everything else because when the disciples, get there, they find that the room is prepared, the Bible says. And so we find that Jesus is about to one and done, the one and only time that he's ever going to lead and celebrate in this manner the Passover. He is going to do it on this night, and then he will never do it again until we get into the kingdom of God in the millennial kingdom. Now, there's a lot there, but we just got to keep on moving. Now, if this was a movie, and praise God it's not, <laughs> but if it were a movie, this would be the time when we would have a flashback. You know, in the movies, they start uh, with some story and something happens, and you're, you're like, whoa, whoa, wait, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, they flash back to another part of their, the person's life, and they go back and they, they basically build it up and explain it, what's going on. We're going to do that today. We're going to flash back. So go with me to Exodus chapter 12, because you have to understand what the Passover is and how they celebrated it in order to understand our passage today. Exodus chapter 12, before we get into our text in Exodus 12, I want to give you just a little bit of a, a, an idea of what's going on. So in the book of Exodus, if you know your Bible, you know that God sent Moses after a good trying, testing time in the wilderness. He sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh in Egypt to liberate, to, to free the nation of Israel from their slavery that they had been in bondage to the Egyptians for over 400 years. 
They had been in severe servitude to Egypt and the nation there, and especially to the Pharaoh. And you know if you've studied your Bible that God sends Moses in, and Pharaoh won't let the people go. Uh, And basically, God does these uh, miracles, these plagues that he pours out on Egypt, uh, nine of them to be exact, that he pours out on them, and they are really representative of bringing down the false gods of Egypt. Every one of them of the plagues had to do with one of the false gods that they worshiped. We get to the 10th plague, and as you know, the 10th plague was the death of the firstborn animals, livestock, and the firstborn child of every home. This is the way that God is finally going to get Pharaoh to let God's people go and to worship God in the desert like he had said, and they're finally going to be freed from Egypt because on this night, God is going to kill, the death angel is going to come through and kill all the firstborn of Egypt and could be of Israel. And so what happens is God gives Moses and Aaron a heads up about five or six days, maybe up to a week before this difficult dark night, before this great event to liberate the nation of Israel and this death angel passing through and all these people being killed, God gives Moses and Aaron a a, a heads up about it, and he says, look, go to the people, and we're going to do a very special thing, and we're going to differentiate between Israel, God's people, and the Egyptians. Up to this point, there's no difference between Israel and Egypt. They're all sinners, amen? They're all the same. They all have wicked thoughts. They all commit sins. Yes, the nation of Israel had been declared as God's people, but that's basically the only difference between Israel and Egypt. So God tells Aaron and Moses to tell the people that they need for every household, they need to go out and find a little lamb that is one year old, that is perfect, that has no blemishes, has no uh, deficiencies, has no defects, that all of its parts are there and the wool is white and everything is wonderful about this lamb. Every household has to go out and buy or find a lamb so that they can sacrifice it to get through this Passover event. And so we join them in Exodus chapter 12, and I want you to look at verse 6. And ye shall keep it up. This is what God's telling the nation of Israel. Ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. He's talking about the lamb. So what God said to the nation of Israel is on the 10th day, God is so specific, On the 10th day of the month of Nisan, which God said later would become the first month of the calendar of the the Jewish people, the Israeli calendar starts on the month of Nisan. It's like our month January. The year starts on that month. On the 10th day of that month, I want you, every family member, every household, every, every father of the households, they need to go out and find this lamb and bring it in. They need to bring it into their home on the 10th, and until the 14th, four days, we want you to inspect the lamb. We want you to take care of the lamb. We want you to, the lamb to live with you. We want you to uh, get it kind of uh, uh, fond of the lamb. We want you to kind of uh, make it your, your pet. We want to make you uh, have some kind of relationship here with this lamb. And then you're going to sacrifice it in the evening of the 14th of Nisan. Now, that's pretty specific. So God says... You'll kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs and the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now, what is God saying? God is saying, take this lamb, and I want you to cook it and to eat it in a certain way. I don't want you to, to, to roast it. I don't want you to baste it. I don't want you to uh, fry it. I don't. <laughs> they didn't do that back then. But I don't want you to do anything but roast it with fire. I want it to be over the fire. And what they would do is they would take this lamb, and they would spread it out, They would kind of cut it down the middle and spread it out, and then they would take a rod, and they would put it through vertically in the body of that lamb. Then they would take another rod, and they would put it through horizontally of that lamb, and they would spread it out and put it over the fire so that it didn't touch the ground so that it would be contaminated. 
So God says that you're going to take, eventually after this lamb is sacrificed, you're going to take the blood of the lamb and you're going to put it on the doorpost, the side post of the door, and over the header, as we call it, of the door, around the whole door frame, you're going to put this blood on the door so that your oldest, so that your firstborn of your family does not die when the death angel passes through Egypt. The Bible says in Exodus 12, let's look at verse 21. The Bible says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. So here's what God said. He said, do this very specific thing with the lamb. We want you to sacrifice and cook it in a very certain way. And when you get the blood from the lamb, we want you to pour it into a basin, a receptacle. We want you to put that basin and that receptacle out towards the door. And then we want you to take a hyssop branch, which is a branch of a tree, a plant. We want to take that hyssop branch and we want to put it into the blood, dip it in there. And then we want you to spackle it all across the door frame of your house and your home so that when the death angel passes by, he will see the blood and God promised if the blood was applied to the door, the death angel would pass over that house and go on to the next one. So let's look back at Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus, as we said, only led this Passover celebration, which after the, the, the freeing of Israel from Egypt, and after that first night of the Passover, after that first celebration, after that death angel passed, and after they went on into the wilderness and crossed the Red Sea and all the things that we know happened, from then on, they were supposed to celebrate God's deliverance and God's keeping of them safe in their homes and their oldest child not being killed by the deaf angel. They were supposed to celebrate that every year at that same time on the 14th of Nisan. In the afternoon, they kill the lamb. And in that evening, they eat this Passover ceremonial supper. And then they're supposed to eat it with their sandals and all their clothes ready to go because that was their representative of God freeing them from Egypt and their haste to move out of Egypt that next morning. That is what the Passover is. That's what they celebrated for over a thousand years from the time of Moses to the time of Christ. It was the Passover. That's why it's called that because the death angel passed over the houses that had the blood on the door. So why is Jesus just now, right before he goes to the cross, why is he, this is the first time and the only time that he ever celebrated as the head of the household the Passover ceremony? I contend to you and I would propose to you that it's because it was the last time that the Passover needed to be celebrated. You see, Jesus, the next day, is going to do what that little lamb could never do. And that is he's going to forgive and cleanse and wash the sins of all the world that will believe in him. He is the real Passover lamb. You say, well, I don't know about that, preacher. Are you sure? Yes, I'm very sure. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells us so, and he talks about the Passover, and then he talks about the fact that Jesus is our Passover lamb. You remember in the Gospels when Jesus started his ministry, John the Baptist looked across the way and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 says, 
Well, verse 6 says, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, wait a minute. When God instituted the Passover celebration that first night when that death angel was going to move by, that first, the day before they sacrificed, one of the days between 10th of Nisan and 14th of Nisan, they had to make sure they got all the yeast or the leaven out of their house because it represented sin. They had to cleanse their house. They had to get every crumb, every, every little piece of bread, every little piece of yeast or leaven in their house. They had to clear it all out so they could have the feast of the unleavened bread that goes along with the Passover. So Paul is definitely, no doubt, that he's talking about the Passover celebration in the Old Testament. In verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good about this man that's committing immorality in verse five, or chapter 5. He says, Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You've still got some leaven in the house of God. you still got some leaven in the church, and you need to get rid of all of it, just like in the feast of the unleavened bread. Verse 7 says, Purge out there, therefore, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. And as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, there it says it plain black and white. Paul said, Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, is the Passover lamb. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus entered, now you remember from just a few messages ago, Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. You remember in the, in the ceremony, the 10th of Nisan was the day that every household, every, every father of every house in Israel, in Egypt at that time, they needed to go out and find themselves a lamb without spot and without blemish. Israel found their lamb. On the 10th of Nisan, Jesus came triumphantly entering into Jerusalem, and they all said, Oh, hail, Hosanna, King of kings, King of David. Hail the Messiah. Hail the Savior of the world. And they chose their lamb. They chose the lamb without spot and blemish. The Bible says that he lived a perfect life, that he was sinless. And Israel, almost all of Israel, or the nation as a whole, elected, they chose Jesus to be the Passover lamb. But then we know, and we've already studied, the fact that from 10 of Nisan to 14 of Nisan, that same month, those same exact dates, everything changed. The Jewish people decided they didn't want him as the Messiah, they decided they didn't want to celebrate and sing Hosanna to the, to the king. They decided that they had tried him. They had investigated him. The scribes and the Pharisees had questioned him. They had seen some miracles. They saw him turn over all the money changers in the temple. They saw what he did those four days, and they said, I don't think we want him as our lamb. You see, they got him in the house into Jerusalem, and they inspected him like you're supposed to do for Passover, and they said, nope, we don't believe he is the Messiah. It'd be like if one of the families in Egypt there, of the Israeli families, had got their lamb from out of the field, and they inspected the lamb, and they nicknamed him and everything, and then about the third day, right before the Passover celebration, they said, you know what? We don't like this lamb. Let's kick him out of the house. It's basically what Israel did. But see, there's a, a huge difference between the families in Egypt of Israel, people of God, that chose their lamb and sacrificed that little lamb on, the, on that 14th day of Nisan in the afternoon, evening. There's a huge difference between those little lambs and the lamb. The little lambs that were slain, now this, this is going on for a thousand years a little more than a 1,000 years from the days of Moses to the time of Christ, maybe even 2,000 years. And what's happening? 
everyone in Israel, every time they celebrate the Passover, is going to grab and, and either purchasing or going out into the field and getting their lamb, and they're slaying those lambs by the thousands. By the hundred thousands, after a thousand years has gone by, you have all of Israel, every family, every household has to have their lamb for Passover. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lambs that were sacrificed on the altar in, in order to make sure that they could have the food to celebrate this Passover. Thousands and hundreds of thousands uh, over and over and over again, these lambs are being sacrificed. But you see, there's a huge difference between the lamb of glory and these little lambs. Go in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 says this. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, just in case you're wondering... You know when Jesus was crucified? In the evening on 14th of Nisan. But he was only sacrificed once. He didn't have to die over and over and over again like all those lambs, hundreds of thousands of lambs that were brought to, to the slaughter that were sacrificed. No, no, one time, once for all time, Jesus had the rod, the wood that went up through him vertically, went through him horizontally. We call it a cross. And he was lifted up off of the earth so that he wouldn't be contaminated, so that he could be the go-between between God the Father and sinful man. And he was crucified on that cross once for all. Never to have to be sacrificed again. Notice what the scripture says, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. See, there's a huge difference between them little Passover lambs and the Lamb of God. He only had to be sacrificed once. One sacrifice, one shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, one time that God allowed his son to be crucified, one time that that blood flowed out of his body, and it was sufficient for all the sins of all the world of all of history. Not only did they put the rod in him horizontally, and put it vertically, representing the cross. If you go to the Gospel of John, we won't take time to do it this morning. The Bible says very clearly <laughs> that they, the soldiers took a hyssop branch and they dipped it in the water and some vinegar and they put it up to Jesus' mouth. You remember? The families in, in, in Israel, in Egypt, when they were in Egypt in bondage, they were supposed to take the hyssop branch and dip it in the basin of the blood and apply it to the doorpost of their home and so that the oldest child would not be sacrificed and would not die as the death angel passed by. Oh, can I tell you, church, this morning, Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God. He is the lamb of glory. And he did have that hyssop branch put up to his mouth. And I would tell you this morning, the hyssop branch it represents the applicator the blood was applied to the doors of the homes in, in Egypt of the Israeli families by the hyssop branch they applied the blood with that branch the water and the vinegar that was necessary in the crucifixion of Jesus we talked about that a couple weeks ago was applied by the soldiers with the hyssop branch I believe that the hyssop branch represents our faith. And when, when the faith in our life and the belief and the trust in Jesus as our Passover lamb is there and it's present in your life and you have enough faith to believe the gospel, you take that hyssop branch of faith and you take the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary and you apply it, you apply it to your life, you apply it to the door of your heart. Mm. 
You see, when the blood's applied, God promised mm, that he would pass over. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, that night in Egypt, there was a lot of people that died. The wrath of God was poured out on the Egyptian people, on Pharaoh and his family and all the Egyptian families. The wrath of God was given to the death angel, we call it. And the death angel passed through those streets and passed through the palace, and there was no place that was safe from the death angel. It passed to every home in Egypt. There was not one that was skipped over unless they had the blood applied to the door of their house. You see, as I said in the beginning, there's no, there was no difference spiritually between the Egyptians and the Israelites. They were all sinners. They all needed something to forgive them of their sins. They needed something to make good with God. They needed something to redeem them. They needed something to put them in good graces with God. And what made the difference between the Israeli people, and the Jewish people, and the Egyptian people was the blood that was applied to the door. It's the only difference. Well, guess what, church? One day in the future, God's wrath is not just going to pass through the streets of Egypt. His wrath is going to pass to every corner of the globe. His wrath is going to touch every single person that's ever been born. His wrath is going to be poured out on everyone that's ever been in a human body, that's ever lived on the face of this planet, that has rejected what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Every single person will face the wrath of God. Look with me in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 in verse 11. It says, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I think it's interesting, don't you, that the Bible says right there, that when God's wrath is poured out at this great white throne judgment on every single human being that's ever lived and rejected God in the gospel, that that's going to be the second death. We might even could say that the second death angel is going to pass through that multitude. The books are going to be open, and all their sins are written down. God hasn't forgotten or overlooked one single sin in the history of mankind. He's perfectly just and perfectly righteous, and he will hold account to everybody for every sin they've ever committed. And I and you, as a child of God, we would be there. Come on now. We would be there. (laughs) Had it not been for the Passover lamb. You see, when all that gets ready to go, if it hadn't been for Jesus... If it hadn't been for the Lamb of God, if it hadn't been for the Lamb of glory and him shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary and me grabbing a hold of that hyssop branch and the faith applicator and by faith believing in Jesus and me opening up the heart's door and my heart's door open and applying the blood in my heart and asking Jesus to come into my heart and save me. Had it not been for that, I would be standing in front of that great white throne and my name would not be written in the Lamb. Uh, Lamb's book of life. But let me tell you, when that great day and that great multitude is assembled, (laughs) the death angel is going to pass on by Roy Webster. He's going to look over there and say, nope, 
Looky there on the doorpost of his heart is applied the blood of Jesus. And he's going to pass over because Jesus is our Passover lamb. It's a reason he only celebrated it once in full, full authority and full figure. He only celebrated it once because he was about to take care of it the next day.